Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Andrea Bodner, the Donald G. Combs Science Director at the Gloucester Marine Genomics Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to another edition of the GMGI Science Hour. Tonight, we welcome Dr. Matt Harkey of GMGI and Maddie Rodrigue of OceanX, who will take us aboard the state-of-the-art research vessel, the Ocean Explorer. Tonight, we're also live streaming to OceanX's YouTube channel, and welcome everyone who's tuned in. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I wanna say a few words about our organization for those of you who may be new to GMGI. GMGI was founded in 2013 by a group of local scientists, community leaders, and entrepreneurs who imagined that the ocean could be a renewed source of opportunity for KBAN. Our ambitious mission is to address critical challenges facing our oceans, human health, and the environment through innovative scientific research and education. Our research team, pursues a platform of molecular biology and advanced genomic technologies to address questions related to oceans and human health across three program areas, biomedicine and biotechnology, ecosystem function and health, and fisheries and aquaculture. We are mining the vast genetic diversity of marine organisms for new discoveries and new opportunities. Our education initiative, the Gloucester Biotechnology Academy, prepares young adults who haven't yet connected with career or college for roles as professional laboratory technicians. Now in its seventh year, the Academy has blossomed. It has doubled in size and maximized its impact on the region's young adults, as well as the biotech community, now able to tap into a highly skilled workforce. For the first time this year, we've enrolled two cohorts of students. The first cohort started in August and is now in semester two, learning biomanufacturing techniques and protocols. The second cohort started in November and enrollment is at capacity. This year, we also began a community outreach effort to explain to middle school and high school students throughout the Essex County, just what the heck is biotech? This program has now reached over 300 young people. These initiatives contribute to our efforts to build a vibrant science community in and around Gloucester and to extend our reach beyond the North Shore. Our Science Tower Lecture Series is also continuing uh, to grow, reaching a bigger and bigger audience with each installment. And tonight, we're so glad that you've joined us to hear about the ongoing partnership between GMGI and OceanX, presented by Matt Harkey and Maddie Rodrigue. Maddie is the head of ocean operations at OceanX, She's a seasoned ocean science professional with extensive experience in ocean exploration and marine science research. Prior to joining OceanX team, Maddie earned her Bachelor of Science degree from Arizona State University. She then earned a master's degree in marine biology and a master's degree in marine policy from the uh, University of Maine while running a multidisciplinary fisheries research program with local fishing communities along the coast of Maine. After completing her graduate degrees, Maddie was selected for the prestigious John D. Knaus uh, Marine Policy Fellowship, placing her at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, reporting to NOAA leadership. Uh, Maddie worked on domestic and international ocean, weather, and climate policy initiatives, as well as ocean exploration and technology platforms for NOAA, and she joined OceanX in 2019. Matt Harkey is a research scientist at GMGI who leads our ecosystem function and health program. Matt is a biological oceanographer by training and his research focuses on understanding the diversity and function of microorganisms um, th throughout the oceans um, and how the environment, how it relates to ecosystem resilience. Before joining uh, GMGI in 2019, Matt was an associate research scientist at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, where he used genetic techniques to characterize the distribution, con composition, and function of microorganisms in marine environments and in response to physical and chemical changes. Before that, Matt completed his master's degree and PhD at Stony Brook University, investigating a range of topics, including harmful algal bloom ecology, benthic pelagic coupling, and microbial ecology. Please join me in welcoming Matt and Maddie to the Science Hour. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation tonight, please use the Q&A function on your screen. For those of you tuning in to the live stream, please leave a comment and OceanX will send your questions to us. Um, so at that, I'm gonna turn it over to 
Mari angkat. Hi, everyone. Thank you so Hi, much, everyone. Andrea. Thanks, Matt. Um, and thanks, GMGI, for the amazing opportunity to highlight our partnership um, between OceanX and GMGI. Um, Matt is going to be playing a presentation from his screen, and I will go ahead and start um, from the OceanX perspective just to give you a little bit of background about the organization itself and also some of the work that we do. Um, so as Andrea mentioned, I'm the head of science operations for OceanX, which is a nonprofit initiative, basically um, going around the world, conducting groundbreaking and innovative science, and then bringing it back to the public using uh, innovative media. Next slide, please. So the mission of OceanX is to explore the world's oceans and bring them back to the world. Doing this, uh, we hope to create a deeply engaged global community of explorers, scientists, storytellers that are all dedicated to educating, inspiring, and protecting the ocean in order to drive forward positive change for our oceans. Next slide, please. Um, and we do this at OceanX through a variety of different pillars or departments that make up our, uh, our organization. So I'm going to talk a lot about the ship, the Ocean Explorer, in the next slide. Um, but I just wanted to add that though the ship is sort of the pivotal um, uh, infrastructure of what we do and how we conduct our work, um, the science, the media, the partnerships, and the education and outreach initiatives that we conduct are crucial um, to, toward driving positive change and helping people know, care, and act more about the ocean space. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, uh, the Ocean Explorer is pretty pivotal to what we do at OceanX. Um, this is uh, basically a floating research institution and media production studio. So some of the capabilities that we have on board are quite special in the realm of deep sea ocean exploration and research, but also shallow and coastal ecosystem research, aerial megafauna studies, so looking for large animals like sharks, whales, uh, different types of dolphin species, or even conducting terrestrial or coastal ecosystem surveys, looking for coral reef health, um, seagrass beds, things like that. Um, but really where we shine is in our deep sea ocean exploration. And we um, have two Triton manned submersibles. Um, so submersibles that can take three people down um, each to 1,000 meters depth, um, so just over 3,000 feet. And also those submersibles can be equipped with a variety of media and scientific equipment. So we not only have uh, movie grade, uh, cinematography grade cameras that can both look really up close at different organisms and how they're behaving um, at depth, Excuse, if you can hear the sirens behind me, excuse me, I am currently at home in Brooklyn. <laughs> um, or you can um, add a whole bunch of scientific sampling equipment to allow us to really characterize and explore deep sea ecosystems and then bring samples back up to our vessel to look at further in the laboratory facilities. Uh, we also have two 6,000 meter uh, deep sea ROVs. And really with the 6,000 meter depth capability, we can reach over 96% of total ocean, uh, the total ocean in terms of depth. And ROV stands for remotely operated vehicle. So essentially what we do is um, it's a giant robot that is about the size of, I would say probably a mid-sized sedan um, that's tethered to our vessel that has a, a cable running from the uh, robot, the remotely operated vehicle or ROV as I'll call it from here on out all the way up to the surface and through the ROV live feed, we can actually get a really cool um, live stream of about 11 to 12 different cameras and different vantage points on the vehicle, all while collecting samples with a variety of different instrumentation. So biological, geological, and oceanographic samples um, can all be collected. And the really cool thing that makes us unique um, as a program is that we can also operate the submersibles and the ROV at the same time. So for example, we can host a whole bunch of scientists on board and they all wanna look at different pieces of the ecosystem. And so using the subs to have some scientists go down in the submersibles and look at different depths that they're interested in and collect different samples that they're interested in, while also utilizing the ROV to then collect even more samples or to look at even more habitat characteristics or unique ecosystems or features of ecosystems, um, really expands our multidisciplinary opportunities, especially as we go to ecosystems that have been very little explored. Um, as I mentioned, we also have a helicopter. We primarily use the helicopter for aerial surveys, looking for large charismatic animals known as megafauna. So recently in the Red Sea, we were looking for whale sharks, different species of, of cetaceans like Riso's dolphins and other type, types of whales. Um, and from the helicopter, we also offer a unique vantage point for filming opportunities as well. 
Um, we have some state-of-the-art labs on board. We have three dry laboratories that are used for imaging and microscopy, uh, genetics and genomic sequencing, which we'll talk about um, in a little bit, um, and also uh, an electronic and technical makerspace where we work on a lot of our instrumentation and um, do some 3D printing to adapt to situations or to make tools or kit that we need in real time in the field, especially working in remote locations. Um, we do have next-gen sequencing capabilities on board, but this was not always the case. So you'll hear a lot from Matt about some of the work that we did um, during one of the expeditions we partnered with GMGI on. And I have to say that GMGI has been absolutely instrumental into informing some of our workflows in terms of the sequencing, all the way from sample collection and data acquisition to DNA extraction up to full-blown next-generation sequencing. Um, on board. So we can really go from exploration to discovery all in the same construct. Um, our centralized data platform essentially keeps track of all of the streams of data that we're acquiring. So we have scientific sensors all the way from the very top of the mast, um, all the way below the waterline to the, the whole of the vessel. We can basically look at an entire ecosystem and collect data live in real time, match it with video observations or in-person uh, observations, scuba diving observations from or dives from the sub um, and the ROV and basically match all of those data sets to create a holistic picture of an ecosystem that maybe no one's ever been been to before or we've never been to before. Um, and so scientists really value that in terms of being able to go to a, a place and really uh, maximize the capability and the capacity in terms of adding data and adding an understanding to the area. Um, and as I mentioned, we have full acoustic mapping capabilities. So uh, Matt will also talk a little bit more about this in terms of um, the expedition that we conducted together, but essentially that means that we can look at uh, 3D visualization in real time of the shape of the seafloor, so the bathymetry of the seafloor, um, using sound. We can also look below the seafloor itself with sound. We can, as I mentioned, look at the seafloor itself and all of the really unique geological characteristics that make it a special ecosystem, um, Or we can, and we can also combine that with water column mapping, so we can look at the physical properties of the water column with our ADCPs. Um, so the speed and direction that the currents are flowing, which as you can imagine is important to everybody doing uh, anybody doing deep sea work because you want to know where the, the expensive thing you're going to put over the side is going to go. <laughs> um, and also um, looking at the biology of the water column using acoustics. So mapping life in the water column, combining all of those things for one complete picture of where we are and what we're studying. Next slide, please. So the science that we've done on, on the Ocean Explorer and at OceanX so far um, has been very multidisciplinary. Um, since 2020, and I will add the ship has only been operating since 2020, um, we have conducted expeditions in more than 11 countries. We've spanned four ocean basins, uh, partnered with more than 40 scientific institutions. We've discovered five new species, and that number is um, going to grow as we continue to publish. Um, we've published in 15 scientific journals. Uh, we've mapped more than 90,000 square kilometers and mostly unmapped areas with our acoustic capabilities and all of those data are designed to be contributed to the public domain so any scientist anywhere can access those data. Um, and over a thousand combined sub ROV and scuba dives. And as I mentioned, we usually do all of this together. So it's basically a big Swiss army knife for science that's opening up and all of the assets going out and collecting the observations and the data and the compelling media as well um, for pretty much any location that we can go to. Next slide, please. Um, so of course, uh, papers are great. New species discoveries are great, but it's not really reaching uh, the mass audience or the people not already in the room talking about how amazing science and the ocean are if we're not using media to bring back discovery and scientific achievement to the world and really to shine a light on oceans um, along with part regional partners in the areas that we're working. So um, our incredible social media team has grown our, our social media community size to eight and a half million. Um, it's probably more by now. I always have to update this slide whenever we give presentations. Um, and we're also working on a, ver a variety of mixed media um, opportunities. So upcoming in 2023 will be a really exciting series um, produced uh, for National Geographic in collaboration between OceanX Media and the BBC. Um, that will be something very exciting, featuring scientists in the field doing science on board the vessel and making discoveries and going basically to the ends of the earth to conduct really crazy cool research, um, and as well as a variety of other titles or features that you may have seen, uh, Our Planet, Welcome to Earth, Blue Planet 2, um, the list goes on. Next slide, please. 
Um, and of course, we can't do anything without our partners. So as I mentioned, we're very happy and very fortunate to be able to partner with an institution like GMGI, um, who can really uh, help us and collaborate with us as we conduct um, research in very um, remote locations and at really unique ecosystems, which Matt will talk about in a minute, um, but also reaching audiences that aren't um, already in the room. So not the people that you would run into at the conference or the people that you would see at the, you know, the climate talk or whatever, um, whatever audience you're normally seeing a lot of people really passionate about the ocean in. So uh, reaching the youngest generation. So our partnership with Crayola does just that. Our, our media um, and partnerships team put together um, an exhibit along with Crayola that is really all uh, ocean X and ocean exploration focused um, so that hopefully we can inspire the youngest generation. I was, I grew up in Arizona, so I was very fortunate to be able to um, help co-design that exhibit and then um, go present to a bunch of, of um, you know, second and third graders with their parents and let them know that I grew up 10 minutes down the street and, and I, you know, now study the ocean. So it's totally possible. <laughs> Um, and then also um, new partnerships. So a partnership recently um, that we announced with the Prince Albert Foundation of Monaco, um, which is a great organization, uh, really passionate about climate change and the effect that climate has on coral reef systems. Next slide, please. Um, and education is something that we're growing at OceanX, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but our, our major educational initiatives, um, of course, are, the, are, I think, the most important thing that we do um, to really foster and inspire the next generation of ocean scientists or ocean enthusiasts, even. Um, the OceanX Live or the LiveX classes that we conduct are, are something that we really pioneered this year when we were working in the Red Sea, um, working with host nations and regional partners, regional schools and classrooms um, to conduct live streams of about the expedition we're conducting and the science with the scientists that we're working with, the scientists, the science that we're doing in their waters, uh, along with them in support of their uh, regional or collaborative um, interests. And to be able to translate that to the local language, to work with local educators, to be able to reach classrooms as much and as often as possible. And this is something that we now do everywhere we go and with every partnership in every region that we take on. Um, our Young Explorers program, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, but really that's our flagship educational experience. Um, it's designed to expand access to ocean exploration, um, to also foster a new generation of ocean advocates, and to ultimately offer an extremely hands-on and immersive experience for college-level students, students that um, are pursuing a degree in a related field or have a general enthusiasm or passion about the ocean, but don't quite know what the next step is, um, or maybe want to experience something like working on board or living on board a ship. So we'll, we bring these students on board Ocean Explorer um, and give them an immersive educational experience with us. Um, and, and then, as I mentioned, our educational partnerships with Crayola, we also have a partnership with Lego and Lego Magazine. Um, and then um, something that I think is going to be really exciting, which is the Ocean Experience Museum exhibit. Um, which will be launched next year. Um, that's a mixed reality exhibit of basically taking uh, experience goers or museum visitors on an expedition with us um, to be totally immersed in Ocean Explorer um, and all the excitement of making discoveries uh, while we're out on a mission. Next slide, please. So the Young Explorers program, this is really, I always say it's the best thing that we do all year long. Um, so we just finished um, our third Young Explorers program, um, affectionately known as Yeptember because it took place in September. Um, and as I mentioned, it's really our flagship educational experience. Um, we are really passionate about working to expand access to ocean exploration for a new generation of ocean advocates. Um, we can bring up to 15 students on board Ocean Explorer where they learn everything that we do basically on board, but also um, get unique uh, perspectives and access to oceanographic scientific research, uh, visual media, science communication, and ship operations. So everything that it takes to really make the vessel run from the galley to the interior, to the engineering department, to pretty much every facet of the ship. Um, really, we hope that each Young Explorers mission is an opportunity for the student participants um, to consider new pathways or new avenues or learn from uh, the field's foremost educators, researchers um, about what could be next if they would like it to be um, and build relationships with a diverse group of students from the U.S. and internationally. Next slide, please. 
So as I mentioned, we've done three Young Explorers programs so far. Our pilot uh, Young Explorers program is uh, what we'll be mostly talking about today in terms of what we did on the expedition. So I won't steal Matt's thunder too much, but just to say that um, this was a group that we brought on board in uh, the Azores and we sailed um, together up to Bergen, Norway. And during the expedition, um, the students were able to contribute to real-time discoveries and learn a lot of really cool um, new skill sets in terms of, of lab work, DNA, extractions, um, and then also ship operations. Uh, the second Young Explorers program we uh, was our first international Young Explorers program. So this was a group of students from the U.S. and also a group of students representing every institution in the, the Kingdom of Jordan. Um, and this was right after an expedition that we conducted in Jordan that was a full multidisciplinary expedition where we brought on researchers in Jordan and then got to bring on the researchers students or students from the undergraduate, undergraduate uh, universities in Jordan. And uh, the students got to do a lot of cultural exchange activities. We sailed with them through the Suez Canal, which was very exciting for everyone, but also um, they got to uh, look at the coral reef systems in the Gulf of Aqaba, some for the first time, um, help with ROV dives, assist with CTD casts, um, and ultimately really fully participate in an in, in experience um, working with the ship teams uh, to conduct exploration and research, as well as um, media projects. The media curriculum involves students uh, creating a group a group project and then having an individual project. The individual project was uh, a short film. Um, so each student contributed a short film, a documentary style film, very creative. Um, and then the groups were able to also work together to produce, shoot and edit and present um, a film as well. Similarly, the Yeptember group, so the third Young Explorers program, um, had, had a very uh, similar curriculum. This was a group of U.S. students, um, and we sailed with them um, through the Mediterranean Sea up to the Netherlands, where the ship is now. Um, and this was a really unique um, opportunity for us to bring new partners on board, uh, like Red Digital Cinema, which really, they really led the science communication and storytelling aspects of the curriculum. Um, GMGI was on board again, as well as the first Young Explorers program. And then the Black and Marine Science CEO, Dr. Tiara, Tiara Moore was on board with us as well to lead some of the environmental DNA and sequencing components of the curriculum. Next slide, please. Um, so essentially uh, the three, segments of, of the curriculum, as I mentioned, are uh, science, media, and vessel operations. So during the science curriculum, it's usually a lecture-based um, series in the morning that we work with the guest faculty that come on board from various partner institutions um, to really develop around what we're going to be doing on the vessel so that the students have the opportunity to ask questions about the environment, or about the ocean, that we then will be able to have a hands-on experience with either sample processing or, or data acquisition. Uh, we might, you know, talk about what we would see in a CTD profiler on an ROV dive or have a mapping um, and acoustics seminar and then go map a shipwreck and learn how to do that. So um, it's a very, uh, it's designed to be lecture based, but with always a hands on um, learning experience right after that. And then the media curriculum is always uh, based around science communication, storytelling, choosing your audience, and then really effectively communicating um, science and, uh, and, and vessel operations um, to, to the world. Um, the vessel operations are always, I think, the favorite because this is where the students really get to get immersed in life on board the Ocean Explorer. So they work, you know, with the deck team on learning how to launch and recover tenders or working on the, the, um, the fire, working with the firefighting equipment, or they'll be working with the galley team and making their favorite recipes in the galley, um, or even standing watch with the engineers or up on the bridge with the navigational officers. So um, it's, a, it's a completely immersive experience that's also designed to give them um, a look at really what it takes to run um, this type of a vessel, but also all of the different pathways and opportunities that our faculty, our guest faculty members offer with their different perspectives and, and different experiences. And then also for our, our, our crew on board, the, the pathway of working at sea. Uh, next slide, please. 
Oh, and this is this is the boring slide. Well, it's very interesting if you're taking part of it, but it's an Excel sheet, um, so it's not very interesting to look at. Um, but this is an example of some of the curriculum that uh, that we do. So this was for the second Young Explorers trip. As you can see, it's very busy, but of course, all weather dependent um, and all dependent on on sort of um, how fast the ship is going. If we have major weather events coming through, uh, what time we are allowed to go through the Suez Canal, uh, various you know extraneous variables like that. Um, so now I think I'll turn it over to Matt um, to talk a little bit about uh, the Young Explorers trip where we first partnered with GMGI and some of the research outcomes and then also some of the educational outcomes from that trip. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Maddie. Uh, I think the audience can see why we are so excited to be working with OceanX um, and all the amazing stuff that they're doing and the passion that they bring to ocean science. Um, what I wanted to do is... Uh, take you on a journey into the deep, dark depths of the ocean uh, to explore one of the most uh, extreme environments on our planet, the hydrothermal vent system. And this was on the Young Explorer Program 1 that Maddie just talked about, where we went from the Azores to Norway and took a pit stop at this vent ecosystem. Here I'm showing you some uh, video footage that was shot over a decade ago uh, on the first expedition in which discovered this vent ecosystem. Um, so hydrothermal vents sit at the bottom of our ocean. Uh, they're found throughout our planet, which I'll show you in just a minute, but at places where the seafloor is spreading or the seafloor has hit a continental uh, crust and is sinking below. And seawater penetrates down and interacts with uh, hot magma that is coming up, heats up, dissolves some chemicals from the rocks surrounding, and then emerges into form these beautiful structures at the bottom of the ocean. And you can see it's it's full of life down here. There's shrimp, there's crabs, um, and you'll see some of that coming up in some of the video footage here. But there's also this black like smoke, which is these chemical uh, constituents that are emerging out of um, the, the uh, structures here. And one of the things that GMGI was really interested in is, you know, you can imagine that organisms get swept up in that current uh, bacteria and archaea, which are forming the base of the food web down here by converting that chemical energy into carbon. Um, and fueling the rest of these organisms down here are also swept up in these plumes as they rise above the vent ecosystem and drift away. And one of the major questions that scientists are still trying to answer is how are these vent ecosystems connected to each other? Because oftentimes we'll see the same organisms inhabiting one vent ecosystem and then a thousand kilometers away, the same organisms inhabiting that one, yet there's a desert in between them. And so how do they do this in these deep, dark areas of our ocean under extreme pressure? Um, and as I mentioned, vents are not unique to the Azores. They're found throughout the globe. And here's a map of all the vent ecosystems uh, that we've documented to date. Um, and you can see they're, they're typically found in these spreading zones. And I'll um, take a highlight here. Where here the crust is actually spreading apart and forming new oceanic crust. We're here on the on the west coast of the, um, the U.S. The Pacific crust is actually subducting underneath the continent continent of the U.S. There, but these are all these hot spots where these vent ecosystems form. And just to orient you. Um, the vent ecosystem that we were interested in studying was located here just north of the Azores. Now you can imagine when you want to go out into the middle of the ocean and study something at the bottom of the ocean, you need to do a lot of planning. Um, and this is something that I worked really closely with Maddie and her team on, as well as uh, some of the, my colleagues here at GMGI. And here's a picture of me uh, on the bridge of the Ocean Explorer, uh, working with the captain and crew and Maddie and her team to plan this expedition. And one of the ways that we can detect these um, hydrothermal events is through those plumes that I was just talking about. And as you'll see in this little cartoon that's repeating here, uh, a common way that we do this is we lower a sensor package down that can detect what's called turbidity. So the particles in the water, and the more particles you have, the more turbid that water is. And so we lower it up and down and we drag it behind the ship um, and see if we can detect that plume in the water by looking at the variance in turbidity. And so because there's been an expedition to this hydrothermal vent, we knew where it was, at least from GPS coordinates, but we didn't know which way the currents were drifting or if that vent system had moved in the 
decade that uh, it's been in existence. Because uh, some events can be quite short lived, by, yet some other events can live, uh, can be exist for about a thousand years. And so our plan was to lower the sensor package, which I'll describe here in a bit, um, and move around the known location and see if we could detect that plume, as you can see in this upper left hand panel. But first, before we even did that, we wanted to map the ecosystem. And this is what Maddie was talking about. Here is an image uh, down to 20 meter resolution, which uh, Maddie, correct me if I'm wrong, but most of the ocean has only been mapped, uh, at least the 20% that has been mapped uh, to about 100 meter resolution. Is that right? Yep. And so this is incredible detail that Ocean X and the Ocean Explorer are able to provide. And you can see some amazing features here. You can see extinct volcanoes, these kind of round spots. You can see areas where there's been high sedimentation, where it's very flat. You can see very deep areas in purple that are down to 3,700 meters and very uh, relatively shallow up at around 1,200 meters. But to, uh, and remember, we're at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, so a spreading center at the bottom of the ocean. And just to orient the direction of that spreading, here's two arrows kind of pointing. And this is happening, um, I believe, at about five to 10 centimeters per year. Um, so the Motir event is here. This is where we know, and it's located at 2,900 meters below the surface of the ocean, which is about 10,000 feet or about 32 football fields, so pretty deep. Um, and our plan was to take this CTD, which is the sensor package I was talking about, and lower it down just before it, kind of south of that point, that star, and then rotate around and see if we could detect the hydrothermal vent plume. So just to orient to what this device is, and uh, this is one of my favorite uh, devices in oceanography. I, I consider it the workhorse of oceanography. It consists of some bottles, which we can capture water, water from different depths of the ocean. And the way these work is um, on either end of that gray bottle, that spray cylinder is a cap. And we open those caps. And then when we're ready to collect the sample, we send a signal down the cable, which triggers a little clip, which releases that those caps to close. And then we can basically securely and safely and sterilely capture a parcel of water from any depth of the water column that we want. There's also a range of sensors attached to this device, such as sensors for uh, measuring dissolved oxygen, temperature, salinity, so how salty the water is, um, fluorescence, so if there's any pigments available to, to detect with light, you can even detect light down there, but also turbidity, which is a sensor that we are most interested in using. And on the Ocean Explorer, it's deployed out of this side chamber here where this door lifts up an arm comes out and it's able to lower down into the ocean. And you can see just forward of that is another arm that's being uh, lowered out or is, that's been moved out. And that's where the ROV that Maddie was describing uh, gets released as well. So here I'm sharing you a clip uh, that OceanX General C shared with me of uh, a camera that's attached to the CTD system as it's being deployed into the ocean. And typically what we do is we drop it down to the surface, we let it sit there for a little bit, let the sensors calibrate, make sure everything is operational. And then we'll call up to the bridge to tell them we're ready to deploy. Uh, and so it's a very careful uh, orchestration between all the crew on the ship to make sure the ship's in the right position, there's no obstacles or anything else before we deploy these very expensive and important devices over the ship. And so it sits here for a little bit, but here I'm showing you another clip where the ROV is actually filming the descent of our CTD, which we affectionately named Carl, or well, Maddie did, uh, but I've taken that on because I love the name for this device. Um, and so basically the ROV is, is moving down with the uh, CTD package, and eventually you'll see it lets it go because it's reached its, its limit. Maybe this was with one of the uh, submersibles, I'm not sure, but... And there, Carl goes sinking down in the depths to explore the Martira hydrothermal vent. So what do we get to look at as scientists on board? Well, it's this console right here. This is the master control for the CTD, and you can see a bunch of graphs there. Um, the main one is in the middle that we're watching. Um, in blue is fluorescence, uh, so pigments. In red is temperature. In green is salinity, again, how salty. And then there's that yellow squiggly line on the right-hand side that we're really uh, watching because that was the turbidity measure. 
And you can see it's very highly turbid at the, at, the, at the surface, but then it gets very low through much of the water column. And we watched this for about two and a half hours because that's how long it takes to descend down to about 2,900 meters in depth. And we were looking for a peak in turbidity um, that was very uh, distinct from uh, what, we, what we had seen at, throughout the rest of the water column. And so there's a lot of waiting. And here's an image of me and some of the students just sitting there staring at that console, waiting for something to happen. And I'm, I'm not going to make you wait two and a half hours to watch this. So I've, I've kind of sped up a graph of this so you can witness what we are looking at. So here we are watching the turbidity, and this is in beam transmission percent. As we're going down, we're past 1,000 meters. Now we're past 1,500 meters. 2,000 meters. We know that it's at about 2,900 meters, but so we should be seeing something soon. Whoa, there it is. What was amazing to me is we saw this peak in turbidity on our very first cast, and this just speaks to the amazing capabilities of Ocean X and the Ocean Explorer. Um, and as you can imagine, we were quite excited that we have now discovered this hydrothermal event. Well, I mean, it was discovered before, but we have detected it on the very first cast. And just to orient to what we are looking at with this turbidity is here's the vent ecosystem. And this is just a cartoon of it. And there's this rising plume of material that rises up above it and drifts off. And so we were right in that plume detecting that, that, um, that material. And here's a clip of- Yeah! yeah we got it! We this definitely is so got it! so awesome! Yay! Yay. <laughs> and they, nothing. They said it couldn't be done. <laughs> <laughs> And well, I'm not sure any of that. I actually did a little dance of, of joy because uh, this was my first hydrothermal vent system, and it was so exciting to actually see it. Um, and the students were really excited as well, so we printed off a copy of that signal and it posted it down in the galley for the other crew to see as well. Um, but here I've stitched together all that turbidity data uh, to show you both of the CDD casts that we did. And so to orient you on the left-hand side is depth uh, and, and the x-axis on the bottom is time. And you can see that we're lowering down uh, the CTD and we see high turbidity at the surface, nothing, nothing, nothing. And then here we detect the plume, we bring it back up and we tar start taking water samples until we use all those bottles up, we bring it back up to the surface empty those water bottles and then redeploy, go back down, collect more samples and bring them back up. And all, all done, we, we were able to deploy this twice uh, for this expedition. And this is another image of what that looked like. So each one of these dots here is where we collected water in association with the turbidity measures that we took with the sensor package. So what's really neat about this is we're able to stitch together all these types of data, not only the bathymetry, but the turbidity and, and the positioning of where we're taking samples so that we can really get a nice detailed uh, picture of what's happening down here at the bottom of the ocean. And you'll see for reference, there's a red flag, which is where the hydrothermal vent system was. And that's where we see the highest turbidity, which is something we would expect. So once we bring that CDD package back up and we have to take all that water out. And remember, it took two and a half hours to go back, go down. It takes about two and a half hours to come back up. But we have to very quickly extract that water and bring it into a cool area. Because down at the bottom of the ocean, it's about four degrees centigrade. Whereas up at the surface, it's about 20. And so we won't, really don't want that water warming up or getting exposed to light because there's no light down at the bottom either. And so here's a clip of how we do that. And what was great about the Ocean um, Explorer and the YEP program is where we can get these students uh, direct hands-on access to learning how to do this and helping with actual research that will get published. Um, and so here I'm teaching them how to how to sterilely take the water out of those um, to those uh, tubes and put it into sterile containers, which we quickly moved into a cooler uh, to keep them at the, the cold temperatures. Once we collect all that water, we then have to filter it. So we are quite interested in all the organisms that were in the water. And so the best way to do that is filtering. And so you can imagine a kind of a piece of paper that has very tiny pores on it, uh, so small that a bacteria can't slip through, but water can pass through it. And so here's some devices that we use to pump the water and create a vacuum pressure. 
And each, each of these containers has about uh, 500 mils of water, and we pass about two liters of water through the filter. And here I'm going to remove one of the filters that has collected all the life from the deep ocean. And again, we're, we're trying to do this very carefully and very sterilely so that we don't contaminate those samples because we want to sequence the DNA and the RNA out of these organisms so that we can understand what organisms are there and what they're doing. And so here they're going to zoom in. And this is what I call the burrito roll. Um, I've been told it doesn't look like rolling a burrito, but uh, that's my careful technique for collecting samples. And those samples go directly into a minus 80 freezer to freeze that sample and preserve that DNA signal. Um, and then the next step is we finish all those, the rest of those bottles that we sampled uh, and take some samples for nutrient chemistry uh, and then collect all the other data that the sensor packages were taking for us. But before I get into the results, I'm just going to take a step back here. Uh, the next thing that happens typically on ocean-going vessels is we, we dock. Uh, and in this case, we dock in Norway. We unload our samples, and then we have to ship them back to our lab. And for us, because it was COVID era, it took about a month to get our samples shipped back from Norway. And then we have to extract and, and process them. And what Maddie is talking about with some of the new capabilities that they're developing on the ship is that they'll be able to take these samples right here that we're, we're filtering in this wet lab on the ship, take them upstairs to the dry lab, extract them, and sequence them right on board. What, what's great about that is it makes it so powerful that you can start to ask questions right away of these samples rather than waiting months to start asking questions. And then you can change and, and maybe sample something different the next day based on, on what you learned from doing that. And so it creates a really powerful uh, platform to start really studying the oceans in depth. But with these samples, we were able to detect a lot of biology down there that's floating and these hydrothermal plumes that are drifting away. Uh, a lot of organisms that we might expect, um, such as the archaea and bacteria and, and plankton, as well as some of the deep sea fauna that are relying on these uh, chemosynthetic bacteria to survive, such as these shrimp, uh, clams, um, and uh, these snails that I showed you earlier. But there's also some higher organisms that are grazing on some of these other organisms as well, such as the blood, uh, blood be bloody betty comb jelly, the sea butterfly, and even some fish. Um, what we found that was interesting is that Regardless of where we were, and we were basically one kilometer, we, when we took samples a kilometer before the event and to the event, and then a kilometer after the event, and no matter where we were, the diversity signal stayed the same, suggesting that even a kilometer away, we're still seeing the similar organisms present. Um, and so it'd be really great to go back and, and take samples at a larger distance to see if that event diver diversity changes over time and space. But one of the things that we also did when, with these samples, we cryopreserved some of that water so that we could try to grow some of the bacteria and archaea back in our lab. And that's what I'm showing you here on this plate of agar, where we have all these different colored dots, which are different isolates of bacteria. And one of the things I'll share with you today is that we have a potential novel bacteria that we've discovered that is a um, uh, obligate thermophile, that means it can only grow at very high temperatures. Um, it's from a known genus, so we, Geobacillus is, is found throughout the globe, but we don't know its species and it doesn't match any of the known species that are currently documented. So this is potentially a new species to science, and we're going to work to sequence its genome and so we can better characterize this organism. Not only were we able to look at who's there in the water, but we're also able to look at what, what they're doing by sequencing their RNA. So, you know, just like humans where we have genes in our genome and we express those genes to make proteins and, and do different things in our body, all these organisms down at the bottom of the ocean do the same thing. And then we're able to sequence that RNA, which is a, an expressed gene, and see what uh, metabolisms or what uh, functions they were actually doing. Now, on the figure on the right, I'm showing you all the expressed genes within the plume of all these different sites that we were uh, visiting, and then samples that we took outside of the plume for comparison on the right-hand side. And you can see that there's a lot of increased activity within the plume because there's these warmer reds and, and oranges and yellow colors. So there's more active transcription of these genes. 
And we were able to dive deep into that data and see that we're seeing signals for sulfur metabolism, hydrogen, methane, and ammonium, which are processes that chemosynthetic bacteria and archaea are using to convert chemical energy into organic matter. But we were also able to see signals from viruses, um, see actually active viral infection down there. So much like on the surface of planet where there's viruses infecting organisms, that's occurring at the bottom of the ocean too. And we see that that's very... Uh, play, that they're playing a very critical role uh, in the ecosystem by controlling um, growth of different organisms down there and transferring energy between different trophic modes. And so what's next for OceanX and GMGI? Well, um, as men Maddie mentioned, uh, we're helping them develop the, the next generation of sequencing on deck, and we're uh, we're hoping to, to continue this partnership into the future and explore new extreme environments like these hydrothermal events and help them bring the ocean back to the world. And here I'm going to share with you one last clip, and this is from uh, the September uh, uh, expedition that we just got back from. Program. I played the Yep. I joined the Yep because I wanted the hands-on experience. I'm really interested in the marine science, getting a chance to do underwater photography. Science communication is one of the most important parts of doing research. I really wanted to learn about all these different applications of science. And also oh, just seeing you've always been passionate people. So there you have it. You can just see the wonder in these students' eyes and, and just the incredible opportunity that OceanX is, is providing these students and all those amazing uh, things that they were able to see uh, and experience. And so with that, I think uh, I'll stop sharing and uh, we'll open up to questions. Thank you so much, Maddie and Matt. That was a fantastic presentation and what a great experience for the students. And really, it's great to see some of the exciting science that's coming out of that, um, your expedition as well. So we do have time for a few questions. I'm gonna start with uh, one of, a member of our audience, Max Miller, uh, who wants to know when will be the next YEP cohort and uh, where can I apply? <laughs> Great question. Thank you so much. Uh, so we're hoping the ship is in the shipyard right now getting some much needed TLC um, and uh, getting some new equipment that we think is going to be really exciting. Um, we hope that the next, next Young Explorers program will be in um, early August in 2023. Um, and make sure you follow our social channels as well um, so that you can see the announcement when it goes live. Great. Thank you, Maddie. Um, can, can you maybe speak to what you think is one of the most exciting or surprising discoveries that you've made to date aboard the ocean floor? I've, yes, and a lot of the things that we have discovered um, are to be announced, I will just say, um, so stay tuned and follow along. Um, but I think one of the craziest things um, that I witnessed, um, which was really one of those moments where you feel like you're on another planet um, looking at an alien or alien life. Um, we were diving in the Northern Red Sea area in the Gulf of Aqaba region um, with our uh, remotely operated vehicle, our ROV. And we came across a shipwreck, um, which unto itself is pretty cool. Um, it was a documented wreck, but it had um, been documented at a different location, which often happens. Um, and while we were investigating the wreck, um, an enormous squid um, sort of photobombed the camera, um, came right up to the ROV and then curled its body around sort of the hull of this, uh, or the the um, the bow of this um, this really large, uh, what, it was a ferry that kind of went, went between um, the countries on either side of the Gulf of Aqaba. And, um, and we had never seen, uh, we hadn't seen a squid that large since we filmed uh, the giant squid live um, in 2012 um, off of our former research vessel. So that was pretty surprising. Um, we ended up talking to our, um, our colleagues who were squid experts and they identified it as the giant form of the purple back flying squid. Um, and what's even crazier is we, that was in 2020, we went back to the area um, in 2022 um, and uh, saw either it or its family members also there. Um, so that was pretty wild seeing that um, massive of a creature uh, 800 meters around a shipwreck. It's amazing. Um, there's a question for 
uh, from that. Sorry, it's just been blocked here. Um, could the reason why there is, so, and this is a question from Sam Major, uh, could the reason why there is similar diversity one kilometer away from the vent, um, it's so similar to the diversity next to the vent, be because of water mixing rather than organisms residing in these unique ecosystems? Um, yes, to some degree, but what we're also seeing is a decrease in some of the chemical signals that are driving the biology down there. And so one of the hypotheses we had is as you drift farther away from this ecosystem and that chemical energy signal decreases, that'll uh, make a shift in the biodiversity that's feeding off of that and supporting life in that area. And so we were somewhat surprised to see that uh, the biodiversity remains similar. Uh, as you drifted away, but distinct from water outside of the plume. Thank you. Um, so this is a question from OceanX YouTube. This is from Alex DeLune on YouTube, and he asks, um, what is the most significant moment for each of you on the boat? So I think guess that's from the yeah, experience. Matt, why don't you go first? I think for me, it's it's sharing my passion for science and discovery with the students um, and seeing the gleam in their eyes and the excitement at seeing something new or learning something new and and being a part of that experience and, and sharing that with them. I, I think that's that's the most amazing thing for me. Yeah, I would have to agree. I think um, we had a moment that was really powerful on uh, the second Young Explorers program um, when we brought um, Jordanian students and uh, U.S. American students on board. And um, I was, uh, we collected a bunch of plankton samples for a student that really wanted to look at them under one of our microscopes um, and visualize them on one of the media monitors. And um, we have different filters, which can um, look at some of, they have different like uh, fluorescence filters over the lights on the microscope. So you can um, you know, light it up orange or green or red and, or blue and see kind of the reaction or the, the different um, maybe bacteria on the organisms and if they fluoresce. And um, <laughs> and this, it was just such a genuine moment. Um, the second that I finally, these things move around, uh, the zooplankton move around in the Petri dish as I'm trying to move it around under the microscope. And we finally um, zoomed in on a copepod and he just freaked out. <laughs> And it was so genuine and it was, he just was going, wow, wow, this is amazing. That's insane. And it was like probably one of the most genuine moments I've had um, on board and just th that kind of a reaction and being able to share kind of what I do day to day, um, but also what our, our teams on board do day to day is just so special. That's great. Thank you. Um, a question from uh, Joan Brooks, and I guess this will go to Matt. Have you seen significantly different organisms populating geographically distinct vent systems? Uh, that's a great question. Um, that was one of the things we were interested in doing is could we compare the data that we collected at this vent ecosystem? And, and I'll, I'll, this is the only vent ecosystem I have visited and collected data at, but could we use the data we collect and compare it to other data sets that other scientists have collected at other vent ecosystems? And one of the challenges is, is that um, people tend to do things in different ways. And so it can be very hard to compare directly between sample sets. And that's why there's a lot of effort in the scientific field to standardize collection methods and an analysis methods and even sequencing methods so that we can make data more comparable across the globe. Um, but we were able to find a couple uh, data sets um, from the Pacific Ocean uh, that we were comparing back to. Um, and we do see distinctly different uh, biodiversity patterns than we see at those uh, other vents ecosystems. Um, but that could also still be a data analysis issue as there were some weird um, uh, things that we saw in the data that didn't quite make sense with what we expected. So it's something that we have to look back at and, and uh, dive a little bit deeper into. That's great. Uh, a question for, for Maddie, and it may be a little bit too early to answer this question, but can you comment on what some of your students go on to do after they finish the YEP program? And maybe just the balance between how many go on into media versus science versus operations? Sure. Um, yeah. So our first cohort, um, a lot of the students went on to, well, some of them um, actually 
changed their undergraduate majors to study marine science, which was super encouraging. But even if they don't go on to change their major to marine science, but they just have a, a newfound um, energy and passion for the ocean space, especially if they're living in an area um, where they don't walk outside and see the ocean at their doorstep, um, like I, I didn't when I was a kid, um, then that to me is success. But we, we have students that go on to pursue other internships in ocean exploration and research or educational opportunities, um, dive programs, uh, other educational and leadership experiences. And then um, we've also had several students who, um, though they were uh, maybe pursuing another field in science, didn't think that they would have an interest in science communication or media and ended up really, really shining um, with our media teams and our media curriculum. Um, and really were given access to tools like advanced cinematography, um, quality cameras, but also just really basic tools like how to cut and edit iPhone footage and make a compelling TikTok story about something that you care about in the environment or the ocean space. Um, so a lot of the students, I think, um, have definitely expressed that they have a, a, a renewed or newfound or even um, just uh, sort of um, solidified passion and energy for the ocean space. Um, and our, our all three cohorts are definitely going on to do exciting things. That's great, thank you. Uh, a question, another question from Max Miller. Does OceanX conduct any research on the biotechnological potential of deep sea habitats like novel medicines, materials, enzymes, et cetera? Yeah, we we don't um, we don't really dabble in that space so much. We did um, facilitate a group of researchers on board in Jordan um, who were looking for anti anti cancer drugs in different um, deep sea species, but that was um, really the only project that we've taken on so far of that of that nature. Thank you, um, Ian Gardner asked, um, "Are you studying uh, organisms in the twilight zone of the sea?" That's for me. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, we are. Um, actually, one of the things that we do um, on board the vessel, we look at a lot at um, bioluminescence and also um, deep sea organisms that make up the deep scattering layer. That's part of the diel vertical migration, the migration of biomass, uh, largest migration of biomass in the world that happens um, every day. Um, so we actually have um, honed a lot of techniques and technology on board um, to sort of sneak up on the layer and to be able to film the creatures that um, inhabit the twilight zone, but also um, at really advance our genetics and genomics techniques, our molecular tools on board to utilize environmental DNA and the sequencing that we now have um, on board to look at the composition of biodiversity in that layer of the ocean. It's really exciting. Uh, we only have a couple minutes left, so maybe just one more question here. Um, uh, this one comes from Jennifer Polinsky, um, and we'll send this one over to Matt. Have you seen anything you weren't expecting in the plume data? Seen anything I wasn't expecting? Um, she gives a great. hint. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, yes, definitely. I mean, um, we, uh, you know, we're doing some complex analysis on how diversity changes with function and. Uh, one thing that we're seeing is that there's actually uh, significant functional shifts in the community as you drift away from the environment. Um, um, that function actually uh, tends to uh, decrease, uh, which is what we kind of would, ex I think it's decrease or no, it, yeah, it becomes more dissimilar to the event. So the organisms that are present, even though diversity is staying the same, are doing something very different a kilometer away from the vent than those that are at the vent. And you might expect that to occur, but we don't have any data scientists on how long that, that change takes to happen. And so this is some of the first data that's illuminating that temporal change in functional shifts in the community of organisms that are present down there. And I, to me, that was quite surprising. Um, so that was really exciting to, to, to see. Okay, thank you both so much. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, so I apologize to everyone in the audience if we didn't get to your question this evening. Uh, but I wanna extend a really special thanks to Maddie and to Matt for sharing your time with us tonight and sharing your stories and the exciting results that you've been generating from working together. So thank you so much. Thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us this evening and we'll hope that you'll join us again for the next science hour which will be thursday january 12th uh, where we are uh, featuring dr stephen austin this distinguished professor and protective life endowed chair in aging health 
the Aging Research at the University of Alabama. Um, and in closing, I really just want to extend a special thanks to everybody in the audience for your support of GMDI, and especially for those of you who have contributed to GMDI's 2022 annual appeal. Thank you so much for your support of GMDI's mission and our efforts to bring world-class science and transformative workforce development to Gloucester's historic waterfront. So good night, everyone. Happy holidays to everybody, and we'll see you all in January. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.